attachment to. You forgot. I taught you everything you know. Hi, I'm Rob Word. We're doing our very first Zoom interview with a buddy of mine. He's been a friend for, gee, 30 or 40 years now. You know him as Kreese, the evil sensei on Cobra Kai and all of the Karate Kid movies. He's my pal, my hero, Mr. Martin Cove. Welcome, Marty. Ah, uh, thank you, Rob. It's great to be here. Nowadays, the, the most interesting villains are flawed and heroic at the same time. Well, so are the heroes. The heroes are flawed and heroic at the same time, too. So there is this blend. And I think Leone's films, and in fact, most all of the spaghetti westerns are responsible for that being brought to the forefront because those characters, the good guys are the bad guys. The bad guys are really bad. Jack Palance also, when he kills... Uh, Elijah Cook. Yeah. Cookie. That was so, you know, I did, my first movie in Hollywood was with Jack Palance, Four Deuces. And we, we went off as a gangster movie. I wish it was a Western. And we went off and talked alone in Greenblatt's on Sunset. And we'd talk about the business and I was brand new in Hollywood. And, you know, he, he hated the business, but he loved doing those characters. Mm. You know, he loved being, he was understudy, one of the understudies of Brando and Streetcar back in the late mm -hmm. 40s. Mm -hmm. Now, was, was Jack uh, helpful at all to you, or, or was, uh, I hear these stories about him being, uh, you know, just uh, the way you would think he would be, just not very friendly. No, he, he cottoned to me. He, we, we just, because mm -hmm. we, we go off alone, and he'd talk about, you know, his experience, and, and I, I just enjoyed, because he had a joie de vivre while playing. The, the bad guy. Even if he was doing the lead in this gangster movie, he was the head of the gangsters. Mm -hmm. I was Smokey Ross, who was a pyromaniac. <laughs> yes. Smokey. <laughs> and he was terrific, you know. He just gave me lots of insight. It, it like like when I worked with Sean Connery, I was a stand-in in one of the early jobs, like a glorified extra. And the greatest thing about working with Sean Connery was I could watch him listen. And as an actor, I really watched him listen and understood what he did. And I watched the same thing with Jack Powell. He would listen well. And then his face would smile. That evil smirk. And, you know, Sh uh, Shane was his first movie. He hated horses. And did he talk to you about Shane at all? Well, he, he talked to me about Shane. He, he, most of the time he talked, that all the times we went to lunch and dinner, was about the business and how to protect yourself. Like Sean Connery would say the same thing, get yourself a good lawyer if you get a good part. <laughs> you know? and, 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 you know, Jack Powell's would kind of say the same thing. It was very interesting. What was the Sean Connery movie that you did, uh, the, where you were his stand-in? I was his stand-in in a movie called The Anderson Tapes. And mm -hmm. it was Martin Balsam and Chris Walken. Did Sidney Lumet direct that? Yeah, Sidney Lumet wow. directed it. What was Sidney like? Sidney... Sydney didn't pay much attention to me. You know, I, 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 sort of the stand-ins and all, you're like a glorified extra. And they have other things to focus on, you know. But this was one of the first movies that Sean Connery did, you know, um, after he left James Bond. I think maybe he did the Never Say Never right after that. But, you know, it was a heist movie. And it was, it was great. And he... He was a very regular street guy, Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. I mean, I bumped into him years later playing tennis on Motor Avenue opposite Fox, and he didn't remember who I was, but playing tennis with him was hysterical. I mean, he would curse and throw the racket down and do all this stuff on, on the other end of the court because he wasn't very good. He had a bad back. And I would laugh and crack up, and I'd say to myself, there's James Bond, and he yeah. curses just like me. He's just the same kind of guy. That's, that's so cool. Now, growing up in New York, uh, watching Saturday morning TV and the Westerns, 
the the westerns those early westerns on tv just like the b westerns because it was so many of the people who came across from b westerns and all of a sudden they were making these little 30 minute black and white westerns the leads had sidekicks like wild bill hickok guy madison had Andy Devine jingles. Do you remember those? Oh, of course. I mean, Andy Devine was one of my favorites. Jingles, and you know, he, he, he was great. Fuzzy, I remember Fuzzy Knight, you know. I remember, oh, the, those characters were great. And on, on you know, Cookie, um, on Paul, oh, what was Paul's last name? Paul Brenniger. Yeah. He played Wishbone, you know, and we worked, we worked with him in, uh, in Tombstone and Wyatt Earp returned to Tombstone. That was his last film role, too. And what a, what a career he had had, you know. We brought him back for that film because he had been the mayor of uh, the town in the series. And so in the flashbacks that we created, he's in the flashbacks and he's in the new footage, too, with Hugh O'Brien. That was exciting to bring all you guys to Tombstone to do that. Wyatt Earp returned to Tombstone. What a good time that was. Yeah. And you're actually shooting right next to the OK Corral. We actually shot in it. I mean, you didn't, your scene wasn't in it. Your scene was, was out with Bo uh, and Hugh. <laughs> Come on, Bad Jack! <laughs> you got to move it out quicker now, Zach. Ah, step aside, Jack. <laughs> Hey, let me show you how a real gunslinger throws a lid. Excuse me. Excuse me, gentlemen. You're on your wrong place, old man. I was hoping to have a little talk with Mr. Montgomery here. Oh, his name is Zach. What do you want with him? At first, I want to teach him a few manners. <laughs> He's with us. He don't need no manners. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I want to teach him to stay away from boozers like you two. Oh, yeah. Now, Grandpa, <laughs> you just crossed the wrong side street. You guys were so funny together, I thought they need their own sitcom together. But now, now you're in a sitcom, Cobra Kai. How did that come about because that show those movies while they were huge successes that was 30 years ago well the you know the writers were very persuasive and they uh they convinced uh billy zapka and ralph macchio to do the show and then they got to me and they said we'd like you to come in on the 10th episode of season one and hook in the rest season two and all the rest and i said well why can't i come in on episode six <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no, 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 we're setting this up. And they were so persuasive. And they knew that they felt about Karate Kid the way you and I feel about Westerns. Mm -hmm. They knew everything about our characters, about the hats and the, and the everything. Um, you know, as we know about our guns and the hats, they knew about the essence of each character. And they were very well versed and very articulate. And so I was persuaded. And I had to be quiet that I was going to be in it for seven months until it the sequence that uh, the first that episode episode 10 season one was done in December and I had to be quiet all the way through until May that I was even in it because mm -hmm. the character was thought to be dead <laughs> well you sure came back and kicked some butt in that episode too it was, it was ter yeah. terrific and, and these people when I came with my notes about meeting with mercenaries and meeting with army rangers and all this what I wanted to do in season two they were already way ahead of me they already <laughs> had this information down of what they wanted to do with the character so it's all in the writing just like karate kid it is all in the writing i believe now why do you think audiences still respond to your character because he was a badass i always say that he john crease is misunderstood he's not a villain you know and a lot you'll gain from that in season three but you know, um, people love to hate the guy or hate to love him. And there's something respectful about the character. You know, I don't think he's evil because, I mean, when you play a character that's really difficult to everyone else around him, um, you have to think of him as a, he, ha he, the actor, has to think about himself as the hero. And I am making life more convenient for all those 
as long as they listen to me. You know, and you could be, you know, Khomeini. You can be, you know, one of the one of those characters out of um, the Middle East. But you really believe that you're doing society a service by whatever your activity is. So John John Kreese is quite convinced that Cobra Kai is the way to go. The only thing he loves more than Johnny Lawrence is Cobra Kai, the integrity of Cobra Kai, that mercy is for the weak. But as we'll see in, we see in the shows, he loves Johnny Lawrence. It's his best student. It represents himself at a younger age. And that's the purity of the character. That's why people like him, you know, or like to hate him, because, but he is pure. He is the essence of integrity. What's the difference between the, the production now in this series, I know you're shooting it in Atlanta, and when you were one of the leads in Cagney and Lacey that was shot here in L.A., how have, how have things changed in the business? Cagney and Lacey, you were an ensemble. All the shows were taken from current events in the New York Times, and it was primarily about the two women. How many times I would go to Barney Rosenzweig and say, I need more to do. And he'd say, Martin, it's not called Cagney Lacey and his Beck. You know? <laughs> and, you know, it was very interesting because back in those days, I mean, it was 84 to 88. You, you felt, you know, you, you felt as if, well, the material was so rich. It was written so well. And, Everything between, pretty much, between Cagney and Lacey and Cobra Kai was, I, I would say, the word was not as articulate on the page as it was when it was bookended from Cagney and Lacey all the way to Cobra Kai. It was good. And I'm a firm believer that if, if it's not on the page, it's not there. I've done so many movies where um, I have figured I could make the script better by my performance. I was arrogant enough to think that. And of course, that never happens. If it's a fair script, even though your character is written well, you're not going to enhance the movie any. It, you know, you're just arrogant enough to think you could, you know? So Cagney and Lacey was, it was very, it was a delicate balance. You know, it was their show, not his Becky show. And I kept thinking it was his Becky show because that was good for the character, you know. Mm -hmm. But I have always believed that a woman could do anything a man could do, quite contrary to that character. So it was always a challenge to play the scenarios. And, you know, the more I got to do, the more exciting it felt to be part of it. But you were just one of the ensemble there because the leads were the girls, you know. Now, when you're playing bad guys, is it something that you you look at the characters and you say this guy's a mean son of a bitch or do you look for something in the part that you can latch on to that gives him some humanity early on as an actor you, you kind of didn't do this as i do now I, I i deal with a backstory and i create a whole backstory of what he was like as a kid what he was like with his parents what he what he did for a living you know before he say in, in a sense became a gunfighter or before he became a fast draw, before he realized that, you know, he could be a sheriff or a marshal. And you do a backstory of these characters and you refer to it a little bit once you start shooting. You can read it once, but you, you do your homework that way. And that's been very helpful to me with John Kreese over all the years, you know. When you work with men like John Avelson, they choose you and they'll tell you, I choose you because you know what you're doing. That's why I chose you. I don't, I don't really need to give you direction. You just do what I feel you're capable of doing, and I'll correct you if you're not right. And, you know, that's what Avelson said to me. He, all he ever said to me was about my villain, I don't want the Marty Cove twinkle. I don't want the smile. I just want John Kreese to be death. You know, that's what he said to me. And I never smiled in that whole show, you know? I never smiled probably to Karate Kid 3, I think. Yeah, and it worked. That character worked, and, and Marty, you are blessed to have such a, a memorable character and to work with some terrific guys now in bringing that character back to life, even though for you, I know it's never died. It's odd. You, know, you want to play vulnerable characters. You want to play 
You know, I always think of Gregory Peck. From 1939, he played a leading man and never looked back. He never did anything else but play leading men, you know? And, you know, all leading men want to play villains and all the villains want to play the heroes, you know? <laughs> and, I mean, people like Cary Grant, though, I've always respected because he, he was able to do action. He was able to do thrillers. He could do comedy and he could do romance, you know? And he negotiated all his deals. He never had anybody negotiate his deals, you know? So he's a consummate, consummate artist and businessman. I, I think about that a great deal. If you don't subscribe to a word on Westerns, you're going to have to recite that mercy is for the weak here and on the streets. Somebody confronts you, he is the enemy. Even while you're watching the word on Westerns, and the enemy deserves no mercy. <laughs>